Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our 26th ECHO session. We want to welcome everybody that has joined us. We have, I'm sorry, we have feedback <laughs> in the hub for some reason. I think somebody is playing um, a device. Please, let's switch it off. Um, so first of all, I want to really thank everyone for joining us. We have Morgan, we have Dr. Tembo from Katete who will be presenting a case. We have Dr. Sinyangu and Sondam Sondam from USA. We have Mateo Levoan, we have Mat Namuseche, we have St. Francis, we have Dr. Okaya, we have people from Maryberg, we have Chilenje Hospital, we have Rose Tembo, we have Katete Urban. I hope you can hear us. You can wave if you can hear us. I'm very worried about Katete Urban. I don't think they can hear us. Uh, Mahatma Gandhi. We are also joined by Makando from HW21. Henry Sichinga. We have Monze Mission Hospital. We also have people from Lewanika General. Yeah. Kanyama Level 1. We have Beauty Piri, who doesn't look like Beauty Piri, but there should be Beauty Piri there. Uh, we have Shampande Clinic. Of course, we have Linda, Lina Mwango. Francis, you are welcome, Kaoma District Hospital. We have Leonard, who really helps us with the feedback. And uh, we have Aaron Sukwa. My name is Sombo Foloshi at The Hub. We are joined by uh, Dr. Lloyd Mlenga, or Professor Lloyd Mlenga, sorry about that, ART coordinator, national ART coordinator. But we also have people from ACOE, PCOE, and we have our colleagues from University of Maryland and our colleagues from CDC. Okay. Oh, sorry, Dr. Devang, would you like to introduce the Maryland team? Sure. <laughs> Can you hear us from here? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So uh, I'm Devang Patel. I'm uh, an assistant professor in infectious diseases at the University of Maryland. Uh, I spent a year here in 2009-2010 starting the uh, program in infectious diseases, which is now the young pet program. Uh, with me today, uh, we have two of our uh, pharmacy residents. Um, Ali Blackman is one of our pharmacy residents who is specializing in infectious diseases pharmacy. So she's a clinical pharmacist. She works with us on rounds to ensure uh, that we're doing the medications appropriately. At the end, we have uh, Chris Medlin, who is a uh, pharmacist resident as well. Um, earlier in training with an alias. And then we have Dr. Christy Johnson, who is the head of our clinical microbiology laboratory at the University of Maryland Medical Center. Um, Christy, do you want to say anything? So Dr. Johnson is working with uh, the microbiology laboratory here this week um, to see if there are ways we can partner together to improve the quality of the care. Thank you so much, Devan. So I'll just give a brief recap of the session we had uh, last week, which was given by Dr. Duncan, uh, Duncan Chanda. We reminded that three quarters, which is like 75% of cases of cryptomeningitis are in high prevalence areas, such as our own country, which is sub-Saharan Africa. The burden is large. Cryptococcal meningitis, at one year, the mortality is 100% if it's not treated. Of course, treatment reduces that mortality to about 30%. Cryptococcal meningitis is more common in people with a CD4 less than 100. Of course, it can also be in people that have a CD4 of up to 200. So for patients who we suspect have crypto, we should proceed and do a lumbar puncture. We can do a, C a crag on the CSF, but we can also do serum crag. It's characterized by um, a high protein in CSF and a raised white cell. Of course, this is not always the case. Like the case we had, the white cell count was zero, which is actually a poor prognostic marker. The treatment is aphotericin B and fluconazole. But we need to remember to hydrate our patients, monitor the potassium and the magnesium. Another cornerstone of management of people with cryptococcal meningitis is serial lumbar punctures. One important thing for us in the era of test and treat is that if we suspect a patient has cryptococcal meningitis, please do not initiate
is a topic which we are considering uh, as we are changing the guidelines which are going to be announced at the AIDS conference in July. Uh, so there will be certain things which I want to be deliberately uh, comment on, on certain questions, because those questions may come during the, are likely to be discussed during the WHO guidelines committee. Um, but what I'm going to present generally is the position for the country and the evidence which we have um, uh, towards the position which we have taken uh, as a ministry. So for, we'll look at the contraceptives, how do we use them generally in the population, um, the women who are living with HIV, are there any side effects or any interactions that we need to consider? And also to look at the we transition, the women from uh, the fibrins and also the nevirapine based ART to the DTG uh, based uh, ART. And I'm glad we have um, Alice and uh, Christy um, who are pharmacists and they have huge experience over this, what we are considering. So they will also come in and also Dr. Uh, uh, Devan as well. Uh, so welcome, Tim, and this will be more of a, a discussion around the use of contraceptives. So there are various recommendations of various methods, 19 methods, which have been recommended by WHO. Um, but also I need to highlight that the criteria for uh, use of contraceptives uh, for women does not differ in those who are HIV infected compared to those who are uh, HIV non-infected. And the reasons are that uh, the interactions are only limited to a few drugs which we are going to, uh, to look at. Now this is uh, when you look at the, the contraceptive use and also the HIV prevalence. And I would like to look at the adult HIV prevalence for Zambia. You can see where we are and also use that the contraception. We have less contraception use generally compared to also the prevalence. Um, this is in the general population. Uh, it's not just in the HIV population. So we see that uh, we have a, lot, a long way to go for us to improve in terms of offering contraceptive um, uh, services to our women. For a brief discussion over DTJ, and what we need to know about uh, the, the use in childbearing potential. So this is a polling question. And uh, Dr. Follows, you can go through so that we can see how people are going to answer this. So about Dolutetkova and women of childbearing potential. We expect significant interaction between Dolutegrava and the venogesterol, this is what they use in the emergency contraceptive. B, combined oral contraceptives reduce DTG levels significantly. C, DTG increases the levels of progesterone only contraceptive, the POP, the mini pill. No interaction is expected between combined oral contraceptives, progesterone only, pills and emergency contraceptives. We only have two people voting. So 12 people, I know we welcomed over 20 people on site. Then obviously, even here we are allowed to vote, it would be nice to see what we think. What do we expect Dolitogava to interact with? Okay, the scores are coming. Do we have any solutions here? Madam Noms, I'll allow you to get the answer from here. What do people think? Do we expect it to interact with the emergency pill, the combined oral contraceptive, the progesterone only? The combined contains both uh, estradiol and uh, progesterone, while the mini pill only com com uh, contains progesterone. So I expect 64 answers. <laughs> There's only 29. Uh, people in the hub, you are free to, to answer this question as well. 
and Nomsa will take the answer from the hub so that we can add. Okay, it's been over two minutes. We are gonna end the polling, but that's what we have so far. Uh, Prof. Okay, interesting. Uh, Christy, what would you think of the polling? Hmm. I don't think there's an interaction. I agree with I agree with the polling. Okay. You need to speak up. Okay. So the team here, they think it's D. Okay. Even okay. Dr. Mundia thinks so. Yeah. Okay. Uh, if you have, uh, some people felt it may interact with the combined oral contraceptive, so we generally just go to answers. But I'm sure when you talk about it, we'll find out. Okay. So like many drugs, um, when you look at the absorption and also distribution, metabolism, and also the excretion, they are linked over the age, uh, diet as well, um, the weight as well, the BMI, um, then the race and genetics as well with adherence. As you are going to see over DTG, and I'll be highlighting mostly over the things which affect DTG, uh, over DTG, I don't think we'll find any direct interaction. But one thing which you also need to, which we need to study much more um, is the effect of the increased BMI, which may be associated with uh, DTG and also with TAF, uh, and how does that may affect uh, the contraception. Uh, so directly uh, there, we do not have any issues which may be linked, uh, but there are further studies which are needed in this area. Um, for ARV metabolisms, we know the NRTIs, generally they are safe to be used and they have limited drug interactions. Where we need to worry about for the drug interactions are the NRTIs and also the protease inhibitors. And of those, mostly it's uh, the nevirapine, which is an inducer of one of the enzymes, which is uh, responsible for metabolism of the, um, the contraceptives as, as well. Um, and uh, the next slide. So PIs as well. To me, key for and uh, the, the, the take home sentence is this one in this slide. Integrase inhibitors, they are not affected by these enzymes. And if they are not affected by these, it means then they are safe to be used uh, when someone is taking the, the, the contraception and also then they can take also the integrase inhibitors, of which the drugs which we, we have right now, it's just uh, Dolutegravia and also uh, Rautagravia. And this is a way where you can have an interaction where the, um, the, um, the estrogen levels also uh, may be reduced as well, then the progestogen um, as well. And if those are the ones which are reduced for the contraceptives, then you can see that there will be reduced efficacy. But also if the ARVs are reduced as well, you can have increased resistance and also increased efficacy in terms of HIV control as well, where the ARVs are reduced. And then if the ARVs are increased, then you can also expect the toxicities. And for all these, we do not expect DTG uh, to have any effect. Um, so for the contraceptives, but also for those that are using the depot as well, uh, the only things that you may need to worry about are the cardiovascular risks, which may have an interaction depending on which ARVs we're using. And so far, again, I can say for DTG, we don't have much of the evidence on the cardiovascular risks as well. Uh, so we can say that is safe as well. The same thing even when you're using the depot as well for the bone min uh, demineralization, that may be an issue, but again, as it relates to DTG, that is not a concern. It may be a concern with the, with the TDF, but again, we are introducing another drug which is safe for the bone, the TAF, which we have introduced as well, and also combined with DTG. Uh, so the questions are, <coughs> are monocontraceptives effective and safe in women who are taking ARVs? And also, are they, um, are ARVs effective and safe, which is 
really similar to the slide which we considered, where you can have the, either the contraceptives affected or you can have the ARVs affected. And for DTG, we know that both are not affected. And this is uh, just a presentation on um, how uh, the levels of the drugs can be reduced or increased, uh, and also the contraceptives as well can be increased. And of concern there is largely the NVP, which is, uh, which is reduced. Uh, for the favorance, it's uh, increased, but also there is also uh, inhibition um, uh, or activation of the cytochrome P450 isoenzyme as well. Um, but overall, you have an increase. So you can see that you can really, the only drug which you may need to worry about of the drugs that we have available is the NVP, uh, which may reduce the effectivity of the contraceptives. Next slide. And, and this is for the PIs, so we can use the PIs that we have, really, we don't have to worry much for the lopinavir, the atazanavir, uh, and also the ritonavir. Uh, and for DTG, slide. Um, you can see the rautagravir and also the dolutegravir, those you don't need to worry much about the integrase inhibitors. So in essence, the combined oral contraceptive spills with the ARVs, specifically DTG, which we are considering here, and I know the main, the main reason why we are emphasizing on DTG is its use in women of, the, of reproductive potential. This is a Ugandan study, and uh, this study, it looked at the female, uh, 418 of them were on uh, uh, ARVs, and these ones, they're also on injectable contraceptives at the time, uh, a number of them on time they're starting the ART, and uh, the failure, also the switch to second line, they're all similar among those we're using or not using as well. So meaning there was really no interaction affected in this. Then, um, the next slide. These are evidence which are there for monocontraceptives and also the high risk of HIV acquisition. I won't spend much time on this uh, because there is um, what is called an ECHO study where there will be results which are going to be released over the contraception and also HIV risk. There is some um, concern that uh, the contraception may affect the HIV acquisition. Those results are going to be released uh, um, here, should be on the 10th July. I think if, I, if, um, if I'm correct, Dr. Foloshi. And uh, Zambia is one of the participating countries and WHO has chosen Zambia to release this. But this has no direct relationship with the DTG. This is on looking at uh, if women who are, um, who are HIV negative, what is the risk of them acquiring uh, HIV? if they are on contraceptives. So the ECHO uh, results should not be confused with the DTG use. I've heard of certain fora, of course, where they will explain that the ECHO is going to tell us more about the DTG, but the ECHO is not going to show us about uh, DTG. It's in women and the risk of acquiring HIV. Okay, you want to go back to this? No, that's okay. Dr. Fellowship. The second polling question. Yes, please. Women with HIV should be engaged in discussion on their reproductive options, A, before they conceive, B, after they conceive, C, after they deliver, all the above. Women with HIV should be engaged in discussions on their reproductive options before they conceive, after they conceive, after they deliver, or the above. Okay. Uh, Madam Nomsa, we can also take a vote. So, so far, wow, okay, 37 people have voted. Is it before they actually get pregnant, after they get pregnant, after they deliver? or the above. Okay, so we also have a, an answer from there, but this is impressive. 
we have 59. What, so only five culprits <laughs> voted. <laughs> so that, that's, uh, so most people feel it should be at all these stages, but some people feel strongly that it's actually before they, they deliver, they conceive. Okay. Yeah, Dr. Ahmed. I would say D, my opinion. Mm. You would say D. Okay. Now, if Dr. Ahmed has said D, I think all of us, we need to agree. <laughs> <laughs> we don't uh, question whatever he says. So, yes, um, we need to engage uh, women at all levels in terms of the use of uh, uh, the contraceptives. And um, there are a number of goals that you have to look at for before someone conceives. Are they, is it an intended, you want to prevent unintended pregnancies, but also there are issues of HIV transmission to partners as well. Um, then optimization of uh, their own health and also improving uh, the pregnancy outcomes um, and also the HIV transmission reduction perinatally. Then um, this is a very key point that the preconception care and also the reproductive options, they need to be there on an ongoing basis. The effects um, of ARVs in terms of uh, um, the pregnancy outcomes should be looked at. Um, and also we need to very key as well, especially as we are using DTG, to give the information to the women out there of any possible risk that may be associated with the use of DTG um, early on when someone gets pregnant. But also you need to emphasize that the overall goal for these women is to achieve an undetectable viral load. And this is very key in women that we are seeing in the HIV clinics, which we need to discuss with them the benefits of DTGs. Many times what we do is we start with it, the problems which DTG has. We tell women that, oh, we have studies which have shown that this drug may cause side effects to your unborn child. Then afterwards you go and say, oh, this drug, by the way, it can reduce the chance of that child getting HIV. We give ARVs largely because we have to reduce the viral load. And once we reduce the viral load, then we know the chance of transmission, uh, even in this population, is almost going to be zero. Then we need to say there is inconclusive data over the risks that may be associated with DTG during pregnancy. And you go ahead uh, and discuss the other options uh, which may be available, of which the contraception is a good option which is available. Um, I know there are countries like Uganda, they use a checklist. Anytime you see a woman who is pregnant, who is, who is just a woman, pregnant or non-pregnant, any age, they have to go through a checklist to make sure that the issues of contraception are addressed as well. Uh, Kenya, they are also going to introduce it about next month or so in our algorithm as well. And also you saw the memo which came out, um, a few weeks ago, which you go into, these are the issues that you need to discuss with a woman whenever you have a woman in front of you who is seeking HIV care. And uh, Dr. Follow, she's going to send, especially to mentors, um, this is looking at the risks and benefits of DTG and also efavirenz. When you compare the use of efavirenz and also the use of uh, DTG, how do we look at the risk and also the benefits? The conclusion is that although we may fear of the NTD risk which may be associated with uh, DTG than efavirenz, but when you look in terms of the overall goal of HIV transmission, you have better outcomes with the DTG-based therapy compared to the efavirenz-based uh, therapy. And also mortality as well is going to be uh, increased over time in the efavirenz-based therapy. So really the issue of avoiding DTG in women of childbearing potential uh, should not be uh, taken um, lightly unless you've discussed all the options and the woman 
things that they may not need to be on DTG. And this is the, uh, the same um, presentation on the use of the contraceptives and also DTG, where it has no effect at all. The third poll question about dolutegravan. So TLD and women of childbearing potential. It should never be prescribed for women between 15 and 49 years old. B, only those on contraceptives should be prescribed TLD. C, women who choose no contraceptives should be offered TLD. D, when women are given TLD, they should also be put on contraceptives. Okay, I see it's, at least it's confusing enough. Unfortunately, I can't see the, the D votes, but I can see that there are five people have voted so far. In the hub, we are welcome to vote. You can just signal to, to Nomsa, she will pass on the number. Um, so do we think it should never be prescribed for women between 15 and 49? Do we think only those on contraceptives should be prescribed TLD? Do we think women who choose no contraceptives should be offered TLD? Do we think when women are given TLD, they should also be put on contra contraceptives? So you have a very nice distribution. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy with myself. <laughs> wow. So it means, uh, it means so the an hub, area where we need to emphasize, eh? Yeah. They have, you are not immune. I love it. I love it. I love it. And yeah. but it's good because we are transitioning between guidelines and the evidence is new. So I don't know. We don't have a hub, an answer from the hub, Madam Nomsa. See, okay. so are we done? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's interesting to see the. The responses. I was expecting better. <laughs> and I'm sure Mary is saying, oh, ha, you see, you need more memos. But also, as we know, just memos are not adequate. Mentors out there, we have a lot of work to do. OK, OK, more mentorship. <laughs> yeah. So really, we, I like it. we still have, of course, inconclusive data. Even when the WHO guidelines come out in July, there will still be inconclusive data over DTG and the NTD risks. But because the data is inconclusive, it does not mean that we can avoid the use of DTG in the women of childbearing potential. Uh, my colleagues from Kenya were, you know, in their guidelines, the first sentence of which they put is, DTG should never be used in women of childbearing potential. Then they go to explain in the guidelines to say, if someone is on contraceptives, <laughs> we can use DTG. <laughs> so a few days ago, and I was discussing with them over the changes, said, but you know, we changed guidelines four or five times uh, just within the last two years. Now again, you want us to go and change even that. I said, but there, when you start with never, <laughs> then you start now explaining. We've already said never. So our goal here is under, for the countries, DTG should be used in women of reproductive potential, one, offer them contraception. If they say they don't want contraception and they want to go on DTG, give them DTG. There are benefits over the use of DTG. So the answer, I agree with what the hub voted here. We need to emphasize this, and Dr. Follow, you have a lot of work to do. We need to mentor our clients on the use of DTG. And I need to say now with DTG, we, are going, we have now two formulations. We have TAF with DTG, then we have TDF with DTG. And both can be used in women of reproductive uh, potential. So either contraception can be used, or if they feel they don't want the contraception, 
go ahead and give them as long as you have yes. mentioned the risks which, are, which may be associated. In fact, the risk is going to be lowered after July as WHO may, 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 may guide. Uh, but the risk will still be there. It will be like the favoring story the way it was. So we said, which are these key initiatives we need to highlight as a country as we first track HIV epidemic control, possibly towards next year? So we said DTG on pregnancy, and particularly on the unborn child, the effects are still being evaluated. Therefore, women, as we have said, they should be offered the family planning options. And women should be informed that family planning is voluntary and is not required for them to receive antiretroviral therapy. And the women who choose not to use contraception but opt for TLD, they should be given the TLD. And I'm sure a question will come, but what, what of the tough ED? It's the same thing. When we say TLD or tough ED, it's the same thing. The DTG is the main drug which we are concerned about there. Then as a routine practice, all women of childbearing potential seeking HIV uh, services, they should have access to the contraceptives, and we have highlighted this. They may choose to go on TLD or the alternative first line, which is TLE if they prefer. As long as we give this information, let's empower the women with uh, the freedom to choose what they want to be on, either TLD with the contraception, or TLD without contraception, or TLE with contraception, or TLE without contraception. The choice should be left to a woman. So CDC recommends it's the same thing, so you can't see it, uh, it's just the same information which we, are, uh, we were discussing here. Next. And also what I would just need to highlight here is that women who are on ERT, WHO also recommends they are generally eligible to use hormonal contraception. That is the message. So the message has been consistent. There has not been exclusion of use of the hormonal contraception in women who are on antiretroviral therapy. Next slide. Yeah, because we discussed the four questions, so we don't have to. So, uh, Dr. Tembo, may you please prepare to share your slides? We'll take any comments from the network or any questions. I know I saw one question that says, can you use Tolitecova or TLD in patients who have diabetes? Yes. You are asking me, Dr. Polo? Oh, yes, it was up there. <laughs> with diabetes. Yes, so you can use uh, Dolucegravia in women with diabetes. The only thing which we have an issue with is the issue of metformin, where you may have a rise in the metformin levels, so you may need to adjust to could monitor the, 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 the sugar levels in a woman and also adjust the dosages uh, accordingly. But also what we are telling people is we are going to, we need active pharmacovigilance for DTG. There have been certain information which you may receive, especially on social media or by hyperglycemic episodes, especially in Kenya. I don't know if it's tied with that never use of DTG in pregnancy and all that women of childhood bearing potential. So there are episodes which have been um, highlighted, but the main thing which has come out over DTG, which you may need to monitor and as a country we are emphasizing um, um, all healthcare providers is the issue of weight gain. And if someone has, um, a, of course, increased weight gain, we need also to monitor for um, other non communicable diseases, hypertension, and also diabetes. But there's no direct link with DTG and the diabetes. But the metformin issue, we need to consider that. Okay, is there any other question? Uh, Dr. Tim, are you able to share your? Um your slide deck with us. We will come, Michael, I see you've joined us. I know we are joined by Livingstone. There's John and Yeta District, Albert Staley. They've all finally managed to join us. I wanted to find out as Dr. Tembo is preparing. Dr. Tembo, please go ahead and share your screen. I wanted to find out, we seem to have moved. I think initially we had said women between 15 and 49. What's the difference between 15 and 49 and women of childbearing potential? 
are we trying to capture more women because we know women are now there's IVF and having children at 16. So when you use the, the issues of the, when we restrict the 15, we know that we have um, on either bound, we have women that can, have, that can be pregnant. Um, either above 49 as well, there have been reported cases and also below as well. And uh, in trying to use, personally I've initiated TLD in nine year olds. Sorry, Dr. Thomas, I, I know you're going to be mad at me. <laughs> and uh, just to highlight that uh, we are going to be using tough ED from 25 kg as well. So children are going to be, to be benefiting with this tablet. And you know, tough ED is less than, in, term, in terms of um, when you look at the tablet, it's smaller than the paracetamol. So, because DTG we can use from 20 kg, okay. then the TAF we can use from 25 kg. FTC can be used from the uh, 25 kg as well. So, TAF ED is what we are going to recommend for using all the children above 25 kg. And also for the WHO guidelines, this is a topic which is going to be considered for it to be included. How do we, do we use TAF and also DTG in the children? Uh, so I'm sure you're excited that even as I'm saying, I use in the smaller age group, we are bringing the better drugs for the children. Uh, so Dr. Muya and uh, uh, the pediatric team, you should be happy that we are, we are considering children highly. They say thank you. So we have three comments. I should have 2020 vision to read that, isn't it? So they say in, the, in clinical practice, when you tell women to choose between TLD and TLE, they often ask the clinician to choose for them. I guess it's a cultural thing, isn't it? <laughs> we are now moving away from the clinician having all the power and we're empowering the patient. So it's a bit unusual. So sometimes they tell you to choose for them. I guess that's an opinion and they're just saying you may encounter that. Does it mean for women that we are transitioning to TLD, it is not mandatory for the women to decide after reports have been discussed, after the options have been discussed? Yeah. Does it mean that transitioning women to TLD is not mandatory for the women to decide after options have been discussed? So every woman should be given the information regarding um, the use of DTG, so the TLD. So you need to discuss the options, discuss the benefits, and also discuss the risk. Then go ahead and offer the woman the drug which they have chosen. And also, of course, I know culturally here, clients do ask us to choose. They say, you are the doctor or you are the nurse, you know more information. And if you have been given that, honor by the patient to choose, then choose based on the information which you have. I'm not going to say here that we are going to choose this struggle, but preferentially, if it was me, I would rather go and give the woman TLD and also offer the contraception. Okay, so the final one is, does it mean that we are now ignoring this viral load thing when transitioning women from TLD, I guess because we didn't talk about it, to TLD? Oh no. We are not running away from viral load. Remember, only we those who are suppressed <laughs> are the ones who should move to the TLD. Okay. So the viral load, it's a criteria which we are using. And so we need they have to be less than 1,000. Yes, unless, unless they are, they are starting. Initiating. So Dr. Sivile has a comment. Then we'll move on to Dr. Tembo. As a sound check, as Dr. Sivile is positioning himself. Are you able to hear us? Yes, Dr. Tim. You, okay, awesome. Just a second. Oh, good morning. Good afternoon, Professor. Hi, hi. There's one thing I wanted you to comment on. Recently, I was speaking to some M&D guys over at TOD, and I was surprised how much we've left them behind. They, they have no understanding on the transition. Yeah. There's, there's one area of TOD transition we haven't talked about that is linking, linking the transition to the resistance. I know our resistance survey is not out, but uh, 
could you just shed more light why we need to transition patient? Because the NRITI is resistant, we think they're a bit higher so that maybe it can be understood from a public health benefit. I think this can be linked to the last question that someone asked that if, yes. if a public, if a pro healthcare provider is asked, you know, what, what are the benefits, apart from the clinical side, we have a lot of staff that are not necessarily clinical providers, but they are involved in this transition. I'm sure we know that the NIT transition, once they become over resistance, sorry, they become over 10%, then we need to get rid of those drugs. Yeah. I hope you get my question. Thank you, Dr. Sivide. You should have asked me that on the plane when I was with you. <laughs> you could have then just given the information. Uh, um, so yes, when you look at the WHO guidance, you look at uh, how rapid should countries transition to TLD. So the first thing is countries should transition to TLD. Then the second question is how rapid should that choice be taken and how should the transition move? So if a country has a prevalence population level, NNRTI prevalence above 10%, then you need to fast track, move patients from NNRTIs to the DTG. Then those that have, um, um, NNRTI resistance less than 10%, um, you can put in mechanisms to, for you to move to full transition, but at least you have given, you have some time for you to relax as you are putting in mechanisms. For Zambia, we have two studies. The Zamfia study showed us that NNRTI resistance is about 9%. The viral load suppression study showed that NNRTI resistance is about 5%. Of course, for Zanfia, it was at population level. For the viral load suppression study, it was those who are on treatment. So we, we are still, you can see that we are close to 10%. So we need to start moving the fast tracking of this transition. So that's a very good, important point. As if we don't do that, then we are going to have widespread um, um, resistance to NNRTIs, and then there'll be less effect on the suppression at population level and increased okay. transmission. Okay, thank you so much for telling us the rationale behind the TLD. So it's not like we're just changing the name of the drug. There's a lot of science and heavy science behind this. We need to remember we use nevirapine as monotherapy for some time. And that's why we are pushing to numbers like 9%. We are almost reaching the threshold for 10% of fast transition. So it's very important to bear in mind that there are some Questions. Um, so, can we use TLD in psychosis client? Can you use TLD in people with psychosis? Because I think the people are referring to the session where we had it can cause a bit of anxiety, a bit of depression, a bit of insomnia. I know for a fabulous, we were saying no. Does this apply to dolutegravir? So we have had, um, of course, the CNS effects have been more documented highly in the Caucasians as opposed to us. I don't know if it's because maybe we don't report these side effects much more. It's not an absolute contraindication, but you need to observe. If you think that someone is a uh, uh, has psychosis, and of course, when you give them the, the, the DTG-based therapy, then they are worsening, you may need to withdraw and give an alternative. Okay, so the last one, with the push of the transition of clients from TLE to TLD, looking at it from the supply chain point of view, have we considered the TLE stocks which are at MSL and in the pipeline to prevent the wastage of TLE? We don't have, on in the pipeline right now, we don't have any TLE coming into the country. And as we have moved, we have targeted that we need to move to about 61% patients in the country to TLD. Then our stocks which we have for the TLE, we have a shelf life of about, in fact, we have no drugs which are expiring for all first line in 2019. All the drugs which we are issuing right now for both TLD and TLE are 2020. So in terms of the supply chain, we are good. We considered all these things. So there will be no wastage? No wastage. Okay. So Dr. Temple, please go ahead. Thank you for being patient. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, so we, we have a case presentation from uh, 
Katete Urban Health Center uh, with Ms. Dr. Tembo and also the, the team from Katete Urban. Um, so this, this is a, from the history, this is a female of 31 years old uh, who was seen in October 2017 and had an HIV test positive and was initiated on TLOE on the same day. <coughs> the, the HIV status of the husband uh, remains uh, unknown even up to date. She has uh, two children who were born in 2008 and the second one was born in 2010. Both the children were tested negative for HIV during the index uh, testing. This female client uh, had no history of using any contraceptives since 2010. According to the history that was uh, taken from the client, she mentioned that she had the secondary infertility after she was investigated in 2013 and found that she had the uh, uh, tubes blocked. The underlying cause of the secondary infertility uh, is still um, unclear, just that the patient was informed that she has a tube which are, are blocked. Um, medications uh, summary. Do you want to move down? We can't see the next slide. Yeah, uh, yeah you can get it down because I'm on the next slide. What does that mean? Satonda. We can uh, just smoke, go on, it's fine. But we can't see your next slide and we are sharing from your end. What could okay. go um, on? Go. I can see it from here, but I, I can't. Okay. So, the medication summary uh, in May 2019, she was transitioned from TLOE to TLOD. And the other drugs that she continued using was Septrin, which was 960 OD. Uh, apparently, she had finished the um, INH and the vitamin B6 that she, she took for, for six months. I'm sorry, Dr. Tim, were you able to stop sharing so that we share from here? Because we are still stuck on your okay. first slide. Okay, I've stopped sharing. Okay. You can go on. I hope you can see our slides on your medication. Can okay, you see yeah, that? I can, okay, I can see on. the medication one. Okay, just read that again because some people may have missed it. So, um, just a moment. So, on the medication summary, um, in May 2019, she was transitioned from TLOE to TLOD while she continued taking Septrin, which was 960 OD. Apparently, by then she had finished uh, six months INH and vitamin B6. And then on the physical examination, which was done on the last visit, uh, the general conditions was described as good. She had no jaundice, no pala or no cyanosis. The height was 160 centimeters and she was weighing 54 kilograms. Her blood pressure was 108 um, over 77 millimeters of mercury and she had a pulse of 61 beats per minute and the temperature was 35 degrees Celsius. Essentially, the examination was, uh, was normal. And the lab results, there were two lab results that were in our, in our folder. The, CD, the CD4 that was collected in 13th October 2017 and showed 203 cells. And another one which, which was taken the following year in, uh, on 8 June 2018 and was found to have eight cells, I indicated that she was, she was a, that the CD4 was reducing. And then the viral load, um, which was done this year, 18th February 2019, and target was not detected. <laughs> okay, so from that uh, uh, presentation, we had about three questions that you wanted to ask. One was, should she continue taking a separate after she had um, a viral load that, that was suppressed? Two, was she eligible for TLOD with a diagnosed secondary infertility? And what could be done with the husband to have his status known? 
Thank you so much, Dr. Tembo, for that case. I thought it was interesting. We can stop sharing. I'll summarize the, the, um, the case. So we have a 31-year-old female who was started on ART, which is TLE, in 2017 when she had a positive HIV test. She's married, but her partner's status is unknown. She has two children, of which the last child was born nine years ago in 2010. So um, she, she actually has not been on any contraceptive since this child was born, but she followed up at the uh, clinic in 2013, and she has this diagnosis of uh, secondary infertility. Uh, I think they did some tests and said that her, her tubes were not patent. They were, they were blocked. Uh, for her medication, she was transitioned to TLD in May 2019. Um, she continues on septic 960. She completed INH with B6 in line with the Zambian uh, protocols for prevention of TB. On examination, it was essentially benign. She looked well. Her CD4 is interesting in that it shows a drop from 203 to 8 cells in June. Coincidentally, her viral load that was done in February 2019 showed that actually she was below the target. She was completely suppressed, she was undetectable. So Dr. Tremble's question is, should she continue septuing? This woman, we don't know what her CD4 count is. Her CD4 was eight, but she suppressed. Should she continue septuing? Should she have been given TLD um, with this secondary fertility, I guess, meaning this is a person who still has this childbearing, child desires, even if they are secondary infertility. Should we have used DTG in this woman? And they, they need some help with how they should bring this husband into care. Fortunately, we have Dr. Devang, but also Dr. Civile. His study, his dissertation was on immunovirologic discordance. I'm sure he'll tell us a bit more about that. But I don't know if Dr. Devang would like to tackle the first question. Should they continue the the lady on Bactrum, Coach Sure. Um, you know, I, I'm going to plead ignorance to the Zambian guidelines for uh, back and prophylaxis. So I can speak to you from uh, the standpoint of what we see in the U.S. guidelines. The, the risk for opportunistic infections like PCP or MAC, uh, with CD4 count less than 50, is primarily due to the viral load. So in the newer iterations of the guidelines, actually, they are not recommending uh, PCP prophylaxis for those below 200 who have a viral load suppressed. So as long as the viral load is suppressed, those patients actually do not need to be on back and prophylaxis. And if you have somebody who's uh, C4 count less than 50, who is getting started on antiretroviral therapy, especially integrase inhibitor-based therapy, EPG therapy, they also don't need to have MAC prophylaxis. So based on that information, I, I don't think that this patient necessarily needs to be on PCP prophylaxis. The other part of this is this eight cells from 200 doesn't make a lot of sense to me. There's a lot of uh, variations in um, CD4 counts from, from day to day. There's diurnal variations, there's variations with concurrent illnesses, malaria, tuberculosis, even diarrheal illnesses or pneumonias. Any of those things can change your CD4 count. This is why using CD4 count as a marker of HIV treatment has been a, has been a failure. The only thing we re really should be looking at for whether or not the patient's doing well is, is the viral load. If this patient's viral load is suppressed, I would, I would think that she would need to be on Thank you so much, Dr. Devang. Dr. Sevilla, would you like to tell us a bit about what you found in your study? Excuse me. Dr. Sevilla, you can come. <laughs> You can comment on that while Dr. Sibile is setting herself up. Thank, thank you, Dr. Foloshi. I think the first, the first question with this patient is why, why did the CD4 drop? Yeah, of course, there are those variations that uh, Dr. Devan has alluded to, and uh, they, 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 they do occur. Yeah, but from literature, the standard deviation is thought to be around 30%, the CD4 count, the normal one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And in my own experience, I had a patient like this who came with a very low CD4 count. And, uh, uh, and 
after further investigation, that patient was suppressed actually. After further investigations, the patient actually had TB, you know, was going down. So I think the main thing is to try and see if there is concurrent illness in this patient. Is there TB, is there malaria, and all the other things that have been mentioned so that we can know why is this CD4 count dropping really bad, you know, to below 10. So that's the, probably the first advice that I would give. Let's look for other things. The TBs, which are very common here, yeah. Uh, and if, if we do get something, an OI, that would be nice. Over prophylaxis, I think that's probably a, from where we stand here, it would be maybe a very, you know, debatable uh, question whether we continue Bactrim, I mean Septrim, or we don't. So from WHO, obviously in, in areas with high incidence or prevalence of, of bacterial disease, I think there's that coverage that people should be uh, uh, continued on on on, on septrin. So that probably would be different with experiences in the US. We are classified as an area where there's a lot of malaria, there's a lot of uh, TB. TB, there's a lot of these bacterial diseases. And indeed, much even in suppressed patients, it's known that some bacterial, in fact, not the OIs, like you mentioned, the, the, the PCP and the like, but something, something as simple as pneumococcal pneumonia is thought to be really still much prevalent in people who have a little bit lower CD4 counts than those who are, who are okay, even when suppressed. So uh, with the WHO guidance here, and our own guidelines where we say so if someone continuously has CD4 below 350, you continue on uh, septrin even if they're suppressed. So I, I would probably lean on the side of continuing this patient on septrin. And of course, to look for other things that are going on, why this CD4 is really fluctuating this, 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 this wide. But I think the conclusion, the understanding should be the, the best marker for someone on ART is actually the viral load. So, so since the viral load is fine, in this patient we should be probably be a bit comfortable that the patient will do fine. But we have to look for those other things. I hope I'm helpful. That was very helpful, Dr. Sizile. I don't know if we have any comments from the network. Uh, Dr. Matua, Chadiza, any questions? The case came from the East. We expect a lot of comments, concerns from the East. We can hear you. Yes, we can hear you. No need to raise your hand. You are unmuted. Dr. Matua. Yes, Dr. Dr. Sombo, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Any comments on this case? Yes. We, no, we wanted most to ask if they did a full blood count on that patient, because we are looking at why the CD4 count, one of the cells in the blood is dropping. Any other cells, like red blood cells or, or platelet, are they also dropping the same or not? That's a great question. Very clinical. We always have to ask ourselves, is this isolated? Because I think as Dr. Patel said, it's weird. And I think when we were discussing with Dr. Menga, he said, Mm, this doesn't make sense, okay? But let's assume that it was. You know, it's possible. We are not saying it's not possible, but there's also probability of lab error because the drop is drastic and it's not going in tandem with what's happening to the viral load. Dr. Tembo, do you have a full blood count? Do you have any idea what it looks like? Yeah, apparently, when I, I went through the file, um, I could not find a filed full blood count results. But uh, I believe it should be a, a good way forward to, 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 mm -hmm. to have it and have a latest for blood count, but it's not found as yet in the, in, the, in, the, in the file. Okay, thank you so much. So that's a good recommendation from Dr. Matu. I believe Dr. Sinyangwe has a question. I've been guided by Professor Men. <laughs> How are you, sir? We can hear you, unfortunately. Onoya and Tim, would you want to comment or give some recommendations? I really like Matua's uh, recommendation, Dr. Onoya and Chimunya. 
Yeah, the, the, we are suggesting that it's possible we repeat the CD4. Okay. Also, I put a question. Can you say that the bone marrow uh, can be recommended? Wow, that's, um, that's a good question. It's quite similar to what Dr. Matua is, um, is saying, isn't it? That we need to be stepwise. If we find that this patient actually, all the cell lines are down, we may want to now consider why are the cell lines going down. We may reach that extent, but depending on what other tests. So that depends, I think, on what we see on full blood count, on a peripheral smear, on a retic. But that's something to bear in mind. I don't know, did I see a hand from Katete? Or is it within the hub? David? David, do you have a question or a comment? Please go ahead. Thank you so much, Dr. Onoya. That's very thoughtful. David, please go ahead with a question. Or oh, no question. Okay. Can I make comment? Yes, please. So I, I think one of the things we want to be careful about is when you see abnormal lab values is starting to chase those lab values. So we oftentimes see something that doesn't make sense, and then the next thing we do is something more invasive, and then something more invasive. Um, I think, again, this would be a situation where if this patient didn't have HIV and they walked in, would we be getting a CD4 count on them? No, we got it because they have HIV, but their viral load is suppressed. So what would we do with that information if everything else is fine? Would we do a bone marrow biopsy to, to evaluate this? Because people will do that. People will, we, we, we're having a, this sort of awakening in American medicine that we start chasing numbers and leads to more costly care and more invasive care. So I think if you screen them for opportunistic infections, tuberculosis, malaria, things like that, and as long as your, your FPC looks okay, I don't know how much you want to go chasing just a CD4 count. Because really, we should never be checking just a CD4 count. We check it in this case because the patient has HIV. And so we know the viral load is suppressed. So this is a different situation now. Thank you so much, Dr. Mlinga. Uh, of course, there's a suggestion that we should repeat the CD4 count, and obviously maybe also be a full blood count. Uh, Dr. Mlinga, do you want to comment on this? Yes, so um, I totally agree. I think uh, it's good, Dr. Devan. I gave the perspective of uh, what you would do in the US and also in most um, um, countries in the West. I think uh, Dr. Sivile summarized it well with um, what we would do in our region here. Um, so for this patient, of course, the prophylaxis would be indicated uh, for septrinus to continue. Um, because we follow the public health approach. But also, we need to know that there are certain individuals who, even minus NOI, and I think this point was brought in very well by uh, Dr. Devan, we have to bear in mind that there are certain individuals where the CD4 will just be low. So as long as the viral load is low, you shouldn't uh, worry much. A full blood count would be indicated, a bone marrow, I don't think we have any reason for, for now to say we need to have the bone marrow done um, on this client. Um, but also we have individuals who have just idiopathic CD4 lymphopenia. So even those individuals who have this idiopathic CD4, where the CD4 is, is very low, you start them on ART, even the ART won't help uh, to improve that CD4. So this client may be just one of those individuals and chasing doing a viral loads, repeated viral uh, CD4 uh, counts may not help over time because they may just have a CD4, which is, uh, which is low. We are going to produce, and I hope by end of the year, we are going to see the advanced um, HIV guidelines, which is going to be different from these guidelines which we are using. We will be looking at advanced HIV disease. The CD4 is very key, and we're going to give guidance on how are we going to deal with someone who has a very low CD4 before initiation and also after the initiation. And also, we are going to be very robust on which type of prophylaxis will be needed. Some of you may see that we may be able to give even the, 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 the fluconazole or in certain populations as well. So we're going to give much more guidance in that, and also how do we manage other conditions associated with HIV. They will all come in one package. Hopefully, by December, we should have this package uh, for advanced HIV disease. So what do you think about the 
use of TLD in this woman who has secondary infertility is the next question. Oh, this woman is, uh, needs TLD. This is a woman who needs TLD, absolutely. They are suppressed. So we have no reason not to give the TLD in this woman. For me, even this woman, if they also had reproductive potential, also give TLD and give the contraception as well. Okay, I hope that that's uh, clear, Dr. Tembo. I don't know if we have any other comments from the network on giving this lady TLD with a diagnosis of uh, secondary hepatitis. I see very serious agreement from uh, Sons of Thunder. Would you want to comment? You are agreeing strongly. I can't see them. Sons of Thunder, you said you agree with that. Any comments? For giving TLD in this woman with secondary infertility. Okay, we can't get them. Any other comments before we Mongo? Mongo, do you want to comment on this lady? Katonda, please unmute them. I can't see them. Before we come to you, Onoya and Chimunya, let's just check on Mongo. See that. Oh, okay, so Noya and uh, Chimunya, please go ahead with your question, your comment. Uh, Doc, uh, you're getting me. Yes, so, we can hear you, Chimunya. Uh, I, I was a bit worried in giving COD to this uh, woman because this is a woman who's trying to have a child, and that, uh, uh, like, we've paid that she's trying to have a child from 20 to the time she had her last child. So giving, I, I don't know how we can, we can harmonize the TOD plus her trying to have another child. Uh, Chimunya, we are in, in challenge also. Yes. Um, this woman would, would benefit being on TOD. This woman is already suppressed. Yes. And your fear is, uh, suppose she gets pregnant, will there be any DTG risks uh, associated with the NTDs? I'm sure that's your fear. Is that so? Yes, sir. That risk is very low. Why are you avoiding giving this woman the TLD? That, is, it, that risk is very low if it's there at all. Yes, Bob. Uh, from from uh, from this answer, can we just say that we should go ahead and giving because the response sometimes is not very clear. But uh, from from this answer, I can get it clearly now that we should be giving COD to women of childbearing potential. Okay. Be given to women of childing bearing potential with contraceptives. If they cannot take the contraceptives and they are willing to go on it, it's a drug which you need to push in first. TLE is the alternative. A woman who says they have issues with the contraception and uh, they are not, they also have these risks which may be associated with the, with, with the DTG, go ahead and give the TLE. So it's very clear. Any woman who comes in, the first thing which we need to think of is reproductive potential, it's TLD. Then you now look at, can they be on the contraception? If they say they cannot take a contraception, go ahead and take, tell them about the risks as well, which you should have done in the beginning. And if they say, oh, they are, worried about those risks and they want to be on the TLE, move. So what we are saying is DTG should be the first drug to any client who comes over to think of. Then give the information if it's a woman, give them the information and let that choice be done. If it's a choice which is thrown to you, then you decide over which drug would be better for this woman. Thank you so much for that. Mateo Levon, please go ahead with your contribution. Uh, yes, Dr. So uh, we are having a question here with my team. A few devices playing in that room, Patrick. Hello, can you get me? 
Yes, sir. Hello. Yes, yes. Uh, okay, we are having a question over the use of DTG on patients with the psychiatric illnesses. The pharmacists okay. here are, should they switch someone who is suppressed but is having mental illness to DTG? What were they suppressed on? TLE? They are suppressed on TLE or NBP. Why not? You can answer it. So Patrick, again, today this morning we are in Matero Main and yeah. Matero Ref and George with Dr. Foloshi. You should have brought up that question. That's why we came over. It came after we left. It came after we left or so. <laughs> so yes, you can, uh, you can go ahead and give. Remember, it's not an absolute contraindication. And that's why you are there as mentors to give the guidance. So if there's a question which is related to that, you can assess. If you think that this person may, 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 you may do more harm by giving this drug, then of course go ahead and give the TLE. So what we are saying is, um, unless there's an, up, there are very few absolute contraindications to the use of DTG. Oh, yes. yes, Dr. So, um, in compared to TLE, for example, compared to the proportion of the risk of having severe liver function disease with the fibrillance of the or skin, severe skin reaction, the proportion of this psychiatric side effects with TLE are much lower. Okay. So, right. so Patrick, so, the, the risk of... Still we give nevirapine, we gave nevirapine, we gave fibrillance knowing that the risk is like not, not it's like two to five percent in some places even up to ten percent but we still get those drugs the risk with uh, TND uh, leading to psychotic side effects is much lower in my in my yeah. knowledge okay thank you so much Dr. Ahmed I'm sure he's saying that all drugs have got side effects and if you compare a fibrance to dolitegravir if uh, dolitegravir has less toxicity yet uh, please go ahead with your Question or contribution before we just uh, look at number three. Question, Doc. Yes. Yeah, we just want to find out on the same client or such a, a scenario where the CD4 is low and the viral load is suppressed. Should they continue being on surgery? That's a very good question. It's the same question that Dr. Tembo uh, was asking. I think we are going to look through the recommendations again, and I think I'll, I'll highlight um, wh what the guidance is for this patient. I think it all depends on the context. If you are in a country with low prevalence of other diseases, you may actually choose to with withhold your septrin. But in our country, we are going with the whole guidance, which says until we reach your, your threshold CD4, you need to continue. So that's the public health uh, approach. So it's all very dependent on context and the country that you are in. For this one, we will continue. Um, there's a question, I can't see it. Yes, go ahead and read it. I hope I'm not out of topic. What is the likely outcome if team health need to answer best viral women? That's a good question. Do you want to answer it? <laughs> Yeah, so if someone who is, um, who is not suppressed, so far we don't have any evidence to show that this drug may work. Because remember, if they are on, T, if they are on TLE, then you give them the TLD. The worst case scenario is that the T, the tenofa may be failing and the amividine may be failing. So only the DTG will be the only drug effective. So, of course, we may give the DTG function mono monotherapy. But also, there are some trials, um, the echo, um, the, 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 um, there are some trials which we are, we are doing right now, the vice end. So, in that trial, this is the question which we are trying to do. We are doing it in Zambia and also in, uh, in Zimbabwe. We want to see if really we switched patients who are failing to TLD. And also, we compare to the outcomes which may be there if we switch them to a PI-based 
and also compared to those that may be switched when they are not fading, when the viral load is suppressed. Um, there are other trials which have been done, like the NS trial, which some people may quote that, of course, those patients may do well. But again, that was a different set of scenario. And when you looked at the NS trial, it's the patients who had, um, um, who had mutations whom we really never expected to do well, mutations to the NRTIs, who did well. They even surpassed those who had an integrase inhibitor, like the DTG we are talking of. So we don't have an answer on how well they are going to do. So because we do not have an answer, we are recommending that they should move to a second line. I hope that's helpful, Mary Beck. So our current guideline is that we do not transition patients who have a viral load more than 1,000 to TLD because there's potential for sequential monotherapy. I think before we go to that, we'll let Dr. Sivile answer the third question from Dr. Tembo, which is what should be done? How do we loop this husband in who has not tested? How do we um, uh, bring him into care? What do we do? His status is unknown. His wife is positive. Yes. Okay, I think, thanks Dr. Foloshi. Okay. Uh, I think the simplest answer I'll, have, I'll say is index testing. I think we've seen some, a lot of cases like this. Uh, so index testing has these technicalities. Uh, usually we combine index testing with partner notification services. And I, don't, I remember there was a talk here on index testing and partner notification. If, if you would remember on the partner notification side, there are several techniques that you can use. You know, you can have a contract, you can have, you know, patient led, or you can have a, 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 you know, the process being led by, by the, the, the healthcare giver. So this, this almost always, it does, it does, it does work. Uh, what we haven't been told also is whether this husband, someone has talked to them, is there some incidents of violence and so on? You know, have we reached out or, or we, we haven't? So my, my advice is let's, let's look at what we've recommended on index testing. You'll find several options there that we can use. And this is not an unusual situation. We find them all the time and we, 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 we go around them using the, those recommendations we have on index testing and partner notification services. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mary, would you like to comment on that? Yeah, just to add that um, this may be a good client to, to send uh, self-test kits home, provided, of course, we clear the whole issue of intimate partner violence. violence. Um, but this may actually be the, the right scenario to try Self-test. Thank you so much, Mary. I guess there was another question, which really might as well with what Mary Beg was asking. Can we transition people from TLD back to TLE? Someone was transitioned to, to TLD, TLD back to TLE, For assuming they followed the guideline, meaning they were suppressed. Yes, surely you, you yes. can do that. And that's where the issue of having suppressed patient go to TLD comes in. It's very difficult if they were unsuppressed on TLE and you go to TLD to take them back. So that's why advice needs to answer that important question. I hope that's helpful. We are now running out of time. Londazi, please go ahead. You can unmute them with your question or your contribution. It's a question on the childbearing, is it? Considering TOD transition. Yes, uh, go ahead. To, yeah, are there clear uh, legal actions to be protected? Because if, if suppose the, a woman comes, you explain to them the benefits of being on TOD, they opt to be on TOD. Then uh, a few years later, they want to be pregnant again, though considering the side effects of the telotograph. Are we protected as health personnel if we initiate these plans on TOD. Thank you so are, much for your question. So is there, what is the legal protection for, this, for using this drug in women of childbearing, but because if they decide to get pregnant? Yeah. So your, your protection is the fact that uh, you have emphasized to this woman that there may be this small risk. And uh, should they have any problem with a child, which may be associated with a drug, you gave the information and it was their choice. That's why try as much as possible to be a woman's choice, not to be your choice on which drug 
um, um, the, the, the woman should be on. We, of course, if you act wrongly outside the guidelines, we won't be there to come and sit with you and defend you. But if you follow the guidelines and the information which you have given, even the, then largely it won't be you to appear. They will call us who are coming to appear. <laughs> And I'll call Dr. Folo <laughs> to come and stand. If I might just add, actually, there are legal ramifications on either side. So if I, as a pregnant woman, if I, as a woman, if I'm not offered TLD because of the healthcare provider's decision, and I have a child that has HIV, I could also sue you. So I would say on both sides, it's important to do the right thing. In short, do not fear Dolitegua, but the risks are actually minimal. Uh, Dr. Tembo, let me just summarize the, um, the discussion for you. Should she continue? Sure. Uh, step twin, we'll be discussing this as we come up with our advanced HIV guidelines on whether they came in with a low CD4 or this CD4 develops our own treatment. So one of the things is for our context, we will continue step twin for this patient. But one of the important things is to screen her for opportunistic infections that she have malaria, because that's quite a drastic job that almost baffles the mind. I would actually consider repeating it as CD4. Um, and I think we've been advised that suppression is really, it's one of the, the end points we look for in people with HIV. Once you're at suppression, you should really not be so worried, okay? So we would have to continue the septin for her. Was it, okay, uh, was it okay to continue to, do you remember she's already been transitioned? So it's uh, the question is, should you now take her back uh, because you're worried because she's infertile? I think the answer is, it's okay to start this woman on TLD. I think the message is, we can give TLD, but let's give people the information. As for someone who's worried about the legal ramifications, you can always write in the file. I've uh, explained to the client about the minimal risk, the impossible risk of uh, potential teratogenicity in case she gets pregnant, and the patient understands. So there's always room to write on the file. So for TLD, it's okay to give this woman uh, TLD. How do you loop the husband into care? I assume you did index testing. That's why maybe you are concerned. So one of the methods that's been suggested is things like contracts, uh, getting into a contract with the patient and calling the partner. You could also do partner notification. But one of the things that you could use is give this lady a self-test kit that she can uh, explain to her husband and then maybe you can attempt to test. Please let me know if it's okay or you need to go over anything. Dr. Tembo, I uh, see you nodding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was, I was just acknowledging that, uh, that, that that's been a very informative uh, advice. I think we'll, we'll follow this up and try to put that to, to the effect. Thank you, so Thank you so much, Dr. Tembo, for your case. I'm really amazed at how much has come out of your case. I'm sure you are too. Thank you so much. It was very interesting and well done to you. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm being shown that it's time up. This turned out to be more interesting than I thought it would be. Thank you so much. Thank you to all our experts. Thank you, Ahmed, Mary, Dr. Sivile, Dr. Devang, and Tim. And most of all, thank you to all our network for joining and contributing to this discussion. Thank you. And next week, our topic will be HIV and the aging population. I'm very excited about this one. And our presenter will be Dr. Agwe Mwemba. Thank you so much. See you on Monday. Oh, so you want Dr. Stanley? Oh, I, I have a lot of questions.